Okay, I think that we'll get started. Good morning, I'm Jeff Miller. I'm one of the co-directors of Grand Rounds along with Kate Elkington and Christine Denny. And I wanna welcome you to Grand Rounds this morning. Thanks for being here. We've got a great Grand Rounds today. I have just a few announcements uh, before we get going. The first is that we are currently uh, planning the Grand Rounds speakers for the coming academic year beginning this summer. Um, and we really would like your input about who you would like to hear from. Uh, and we're seeking a broad set of speakers as always, but we really are you know, making significant efforts to maximize the diversity of the, the talks that you hear in the coming year and diversity construed broadly. So diversity of topic areas and diversity of speakers, gender diversity and representation of underrepresented minorities. Um, We'll put a, Simon, do you have the link handy? If not, I can grab it from my notes from last week. We'll put a link in the chat um, for a survey, a questionnaire that you can complete to nominate or suggest speakers for Grand Rounds for the coming year. And we really encourage everyone to complete the survey and to suggest people whose work is compelling and also who are compelling speakers. Um, it really is ideal if you nominate people who you've actually heard speak and who speak in a compelling way. Okay, great. Um, and then during today's Grand Rounds, I would encourage you to submit questions at any point during the talk. Well, if a question pops into your head, throw it into the Q&A button uh, while it's fresh in your mind. Um, not in the chat feature, but in the Q&A feature. Uh, if you hover toward the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see it. And we will, as always, prioritize questions from trainees. So if you're a trainee, please start your question with the word trainee. Okay, uh, next week we have uh, an internal speaker for our Grand Rounds presentation, Dr. Sean Escola, an assistant professor of psychiatry here at Columbia, will be giving a talk entitled Circuit Level Theories in Motor Learning. So I'm really pleased to introduce today's Grand Rounds speaker. Um, it's sort of following on the theme, uh, Nolan, last week we had Catherine Skango speak um, about um, uh, deep brain stimulation and personalized approaches to deep brain stimulation. So we're continuing on our theme of neuromodulation and cutting edge approaches to neuromodulation from California based researchers. Uh, we're really thrilled uh, to have Nolan Williams speak today at Grand Rounds. Dr. Williams is currently assistant professor of psychiatry at Stanford. He received his bachelor's degree in biology at the College of Charleston and then an MD at Medical University of South Carolina at Musk. Um, and he stayed at Musk for residency training, interestingly doing a dual training program there in both neurology and psychiatry, uh, followed by postdoctoral training at also at Musk in human neuroscience and interventional psychiatry, moving closer to the topic of today's talk. Um, and after that postdoctoral training, he moved to Stanford in 2014 uh, and he became the director of the Stanford Brain Stimulation Laboratory and joined the faculty there in 2019. Um, he's received numerous awards and I just wanted to highlight one of them in particular, uh, which is the, uh, the Clerman Prize by, from BBRF from NARSAD, which was established by our own Myrna Weissman in memory of her late husband, Gerald Clerman, uh, which honors exceptional clinical research by a young investigator grantee. Um, and another notable award, Dr. Williams received the National Institute of Mental Health Biobehavioral Research Award for Innovative New Scientists in 2020. Uh, and in terms of the, his topic areas, his research involves a few areas, examining the use uh, of spaced learning theory in the application of neurostimulation techniques, development and mechanistic understanding of rapid acting antidepressants, and identifying objective biomarkers that predict neuromodulation responses in treatment resistant neuropsychiatric conditions. And so that's a good segue into the title of today's talk, which is Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. So Nolan, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning on the West Coast and welcome. Thanks for having me. I'll pull my slides up, all right. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. Excited to give this talk. Um, wish I could be there uh, in person, but uh, this is uh, this is great as well. 
Um, so here are my disclosures, do some consulting for a couple of companies. And so I'm gonna go through um, a background for neuromodulation um, in depression generally, talk about um, recent developments generally in, in stimulation approaches and targeting approaches, and then talk about what we've been working on at Stanford. And so, you know, part of part of the conceptualization of, of what we're working on, and I'm sure what you what you got out of uh, last week's talk with Catherine Scangos is this idea that, you know, a lot of us think that uh, we're transitioning into a new era within psychiatry. If psychiatry 1.0 is, you know, psychotherapy 2.0 is medication, 3.0 is this focus on, on uh, circuitry, uh, which includes the first two eras, but then uh, additionally includes this idea of being able to focally stimulate in, uh, in brain networks and, and modulate, uh, modulate uh, neuropsychiatric conditions. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about this era is that it's a, a common circuit language that, that we share with, uh, with uh, neurologists, neurosurgeons, and we can really think about these problems all as circuit conditions um, I've focused a lot of my time on thinking about treatment resistant depression, you know, and if you, you know, the statistics of treatment resistant depression, it's kind of obvious why, why one would do that, right? About a fifth of Americans experience depression. It's the leading cause of disability and about a third of people with, uh, with depression experience this treatment resistant form. And that's where all the, the real cost is, right? Um, folks that have treatment resistance. Um, are quite the, the kind of uh, financial burden. They suffer, arguably suffer the most and, um, and have uh, quite a high suicide uh, risk. And uh, treatment resistance is really reflected in brain networks. And, and I'm gonna show this slide and then I'll reference back to it later on. Um, this was an early, this is early work using resting state functional connectivity, Mike Reaches and Alan Schatzberg and, and others uh, demonstrating that the, the amount of functional connectivity between the subgenual anterior cingulate and the default mode network was linearly related to, to the time um, in the current episodes. So the longer you're in that episode, the more um, connectivity between the subgenual um, anterior cingulate and the default mode network um, accumulated. And, and we'll talk about that uh, in a bit later. And so, as many of you know that work on um, work in this area of treatment resistant depression, uh, you know we we try to determine if this person really truly has a, a primary depression or if it's a you know a medical cause. And then once we've established that they have true treatment resistant depression, you know we try a series of steps uh, on the STAR D algorithm. And um, after that point, you get to a point where folks have failed a number of medication classes and they they arrive at, uh, at this um, area of interventional psychiatry, right? Where, um, you know, people are considering neurostimulation approaches or ketamine, whether it be, you know, RTMS or ECT. Um, we don't really have a good handle on algorithms at this point in the treatment uh, resistance um, uh, kind of level. And so, you know, there haven't been good studies uh, demonstrating whether RTMS is a good first choice or, or ketamine or, or ECT. And we really think about you know, doing the, the least amount of harm um, that we can, but that, you know, there isn't a consensus on, on that uh, decision-making. And as many of you are aware that uh, work in this area, um, you know, depression is, is quite disabling, right? So folks with moderate depression, um, it's the same level of disability as acutely having a heart attack, um, severe depression, the same level of disability as dying of cancer um, without treatment, right? So quite, quite a disabling condition. And, um, you know, we, we put a lot of money into cardiovascular health um, at, at the federal level. We put a lot of money into um, cancer treatments at the federal level. And uh, these things are, these, these conditions are just as uh, disabling and really, um, you know, need to highlight the, the need for more urgent funding because of that level of disability. And so I've, I've focused specifically on um, trying to solve a clinical problem 
um, where there isn't really a, a, an overall solution for it, right? So um, in the rest of medicine, um, if you escalate acuity, you escalate the number of treatments and tests, right? So if I am having chest pain in my primary care doctor's office, they're gonna give me an aspirin. Maybe they, maybe they have a statin around, I don't know. They, they're gonna get an EKG. They're gonna send me to the emergency room. I'm gonna get more tests and more treatments in the emergency room, more, more aggressive tests, more aggressive treatments, right? And if I need to go, if I truly have cardiac, you know, um, ischemia, I'm gonna go up to the ICU, I'm gonna go to the cath lab and I'm gonna get more tests and more treatments. The same is true in neurology, the same is true in, you know, all the other areas of, of medicine, right? And in psychiatry, as we escalate acuity, we lose treatments and there are no tests, right? So <clears throat> if I, I'm out in the community, I have treatment resistant depression, I have access to, to repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, I have access to the ketamine clinics, however you feel about that. Um, as a generality, I have more access to ECT <clears throat> because only 10% of US hospitals have ECT. Um, so if I'm an outpatient, I can drive to wherever I need to drive to or somebody can drive me rather to, to wherever I need to, to be driven to to get ECT. Um, but, um, but as you escalate acuity and you go into the hospital, you lose access to all of those, all of those things. And um, about a half a million people a year in the United States are hospitalized for suicidal depression. And another statistic, which is really alarming one, is that the period of time after hospitalization uh, that one to three months after hospitalization is the highest risk for completed suicide lifetime, right? And so if you, you take somebody, you admit them for their first mood, um, you know, mood disorder related uh, psychiatric admission, that period of time right after they get discharged is the, the highest risk time ever. And we don't really have treatments, you know, specifically designed to um, to deal with this acute period. You know, some people get ECT, but if you look at the statistics, only about 1.5% of people who are Medicare, Medicaid eligible to get ECT um, for this actually get it in the United States because nine tenths of US psychiatric hospitals don't have ECT and the one tenth that, that does have ECT, only one seventh of patients want to get it. Now, I'm not here to say, you know, my, you know, I, I think ECT is a great treatment. I think that there are some cognitive um, side effects for some people, um, but it's not scalable. It hasn't scaled in 30 years, right? And so that's, that's, that's the kind of the, the reality of it. Um, and to, to think that we're going to solve this problem with, with trying to somehow scale ECT, I think folks have been trying to do that for a long time. So we have to kind of step out of the the box of thinking that that's the only hammer that we have and think, can we design, you know, a treatment for this problem, right? And, and we know why that's important, right? Folks are, if, if the Columbia's uh, emergency room is anything um, like Stanford's, right? Uh, it looks a whole lot like this, right? Where folks are sitting in, the be in beds, boarding in the emergency room, waiting on psychiatric beds. Right, so we have this problem of flow and we have this problem of risk after discharge, right? So everybody's waiting on the psychiatric bed, they get there and then as soon as they leave, you know, they have this huge risk period, you know, to the point where, you know, in a, kind of in a nonpartisan way, multiple administrations have called for longer lengths of stay for psychiatric patients. Right. So, but, but that can't be, that can't really be the solution, right? We have to innovate kind of going forward. And, and so as many of you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the psychiatric uh, treatments that we've come up with have been discovered, not, not engineered. Right. And so to kind of segue into um, conventional RTMS, um, 
you know, so this was an approach that was conceived of about a decade after um, RTMS as a technology was invented, right? So in 1985, Tony Barker invented um, the TMS coil. It was not thought to be at the time a therapeutic tool. Um, and, and that's what's really important to understand. If I can get one piece of information across to everyone, I'd like to be really clear that RTMS is not a treatment. RTMS is a tool. The protocol that you use is the treatment, right? Um, think about it more like, you know, uh, a pill casing, right? It is the vehicle of which you get the treatment um, into the patient, right? And so the first kind of version of this um, was, was based off of a lot of parametric work that was being done at NINDS in, in the early to mid 1990s. And, um, and what they found was that if you use certain parameter sets, you can excite motor cortex. And I can get in, you know, I can get into, for, for interested parties, into the details of that offline. But essentially, you know, you can measure uh, pretty reliably um, how excitable motor, motor cortex is. You can use what you think are biologically active stimulation approaches to modulate that excitability. And then you can measure that again. And that's how we determine TMS parameters, right? And we've, we've been doing that for a very long time, since the early, late 80s, early 90s. And, um, and the first RTMS approach that Mark George and others pioneers, pioneered in the mid 1990s was based off of these early motor physiology experiments. And as you can imagine, um, there was a lot of concern about what this would do. In fact, there were a lot of uh, American epileptologists who told the folks in, in Europe, this was a crazy idea to use electromagnets and essentially use Faraday's law to depolarize cortical neurons because they thought there were gonna be a ton of seizures and uh, this was a very unsafe thing to do and they had reasons to think that. But, you know, um, folks, folks kind of went forward with it. They pioneered this, but, uh, you know, in the back of their mind, this was, um, a, you know, this needed to be a very safe approach. And so because of that, they started with really short, um, stimulation approaches, very kind of conservative once a day stimulations. And over time, we've had not a, not really a revolution, right? But an evolution of those parameter sets. And you see in the figure on the right, as you increase the number of days, you increase the intensity, you increase the pulses per day, you start to pick up more and more folks responding to RTMS. The, the target, the actual place where stimulation um, is targeted was based off of averages of uh, positions, the left or lateral prefrontal cortex, because it was involved in, um, in mood regulation. And so this is the, the schedule um, that was originally conceived and kind of evolved into the late 2000s. So this idea that you're going to give 10 hertz, which is excitatory motor, motor cortex, and you know we know now is generally excitable. Um, we give 3,000 pulses per day for five days a week for for uh, six weeks, and so that's 90,000 RTMS pulses over this kind of average skull position. So we're not talking about a an average brain target. We're talking about an an average skull position, same spot on the skull. Um, different uh, different spot um, depending upon the brain. And remarkably, in open label trials, about a third of people with treatment pretty you know pretty far along treatment resistant depression remit, about two thirds of people hold it to six months. you get more if you give more maintenance or TMS. And you know the the early trials people have the, the randomized control trials people have, you know, various opinions about that and, and how effective it is relative to other things. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that if you zoom back and, and you remember that RTMS is a tool and the protocol is the treatment, then as a first blush of doing something completely different, 
in, in treatments for psychiatrists actually pretty good with what we knew in the mid 90s and the early 2000s. And, you know, just to highlight this, you know, the schedule, you know, like I said, five days a week over six weeks. There was a, a recent um, non inferiority trial I'll talk about in a bit where they used a form of stimulation called intermittent theta burst and demonstrated non inferiority to conventional RTMS, giving 600 pulses over three minutes. Um, Intermittent theta burst is based off of um, off of this idea that you can use um, rhythms from the mammalian brain and play them back through a TMS coil. And so, if you record an hippocampal slice in in, uh, in, a, in a mouse brain and you you get that rhythm, what you're getting is this kind of theta gamma um, signal with the theta being the kind of AM radio and the gamma being the FM radio, right? You have the ability to have um, really, um, really dense information packed locally and that's the high frequency information. And then you have the ability to have longer range information um, that's, that's less dense. And so, um, so you can actually model this in a TMS coil and this was, done and published in, in the uh, mid 2000s in, in neuron. And what they did is they, um, they, they fired off three 50 Hertz uh, pulses every fifth of a second for two set for two seconds long. So, um, you know, 10 triplets and um, they were able to do that, um, you know, with an eight second inner train interval um, over and over again and, and produce excitation of the brain. And then if you don't, do that um, that eight second inner train interval and you just do it continuously you, you produce um, inhibition or depotentiation this is just another way of looking at it so two seconds on for the excitatory form eight seconds off versus continuous data burst which is which is just continuously giving triplets at 50 hertz every fifth of a second these are you know these are patterns and patterns and patterns you know the, the ctbs is a pattern and a pattern the ITBS is a pattern and a pattern and a pattern, right? Versus conventional RTMS where, where it's, a, it's, it's less patterned. And because of that, it's less sophisticated and it's less, um, less efficient because it's not modeled after mammalian brain signaling. And so, you know, one way of looking at that, uh, and here's, here's just the way to kind of read that out, right? So this is excitation, this is inhibition, and one way to think about that is, can we, can we use this to uh, treat people, uh, more people in a, in, a, in a given TMS chair? And that's the Canadian, that was the Canadian's uh, thoughts about this. The so three Canadian groups did this non-impurity trial. I'll show you the, the figure four in a second. And their, their goal really was to say, okay, you know, we have finite resources. We wanna treat as many Canadians as we can. Can we put more people in a given chair? If I buy one chair and one stimulator, can I treat 20 people in a day instead of 10, 30 people in a day instead of 10? How would I do that? Well, I can do that by you know, using these more efficient stimulation forms. Um, this was a Taiwanese study um, on the kind of second uh, bullet point uh, where they gave 1800 pulses per session um, over two weeks and were able to treat treat, um, you know, fairly um, well treat some, some moderately severe treatment resistant depression folks. And so this is the, this is that non-inferiority study I was talking about earlier. You can see the overlapping lines, right? So this is what you want to see with a non-inferiority study. It's actually probably the most compelling non-inferiority study uh, most have ever seen. And this is in the Lancet, I mean, really just superimposed other than week five, it's a little different. I mean, the, the, those, those average um, changes are really the same. And so, you know, this 400 patients, this was submitted to, to the FDA in 2018 and resulted in FDA approval for this really efficient form of, of TMS. And um, remember this is, you know, still on the same six week schedule. It doesn't solve this kind of rapidity issue or, or efficacy issue really solves this issue of um, health economics, right? Can I treat more people with, with a given machine? Uh, can I you know, have more folks um, 
experience TMS um, with, with, with a finite amount of resources, that sort of thinking. Um, what's interesting that, you know, we, we can derive both out of the motor, motor physiology, you know, human motor physiology experiments that I was describing earlier and the uh, depression, this depression trial is this idea that pulse for pulse, this um, ITBS is much more potent, right? So 600 pulses will deliver the same outcome per session or 1800 pulses will deliver the same outcome per session compared to um, conventional RTMS. So you wanna pay attention to this pulse potency number here. And then, you know, you can get away with giving uh, a fifth of the number of pulses per course. And I'll talk, all of, you know, these seem like random numbers at a level right now, but I'll talk about why this matters later on if you can just kind of remember these, these numbers. And again, non-inferior, just to kind of drive home that point. And so we've gotten interested in this idea of being able to, to really re-engineer our TMS. And, and you wanna kind of go back, when, you, when you're doing an engineering sort of exercise, right? you wanna go back to this idea of, what do we know now that we didn't know before when the RTMS approach was, was developed before, right? So this idea that, that because it was an engineered approach in the first go round in this kind of 1995 version, and because RTMS is a device that can do all sorts of things, right? Therapeutic things, you know, inert things, maybe, th maybe um, can produce, um, you know, symptomatic worsening if you did it the wrong way and you chose to do things that you, that, that we kind of conceptually uh, avoid as a field, um, you know, then, then you, you have to kind of think about re-engineering it if you want to really try to change both the outcome and, and some of the kind of read out aspects of those, of those stimulation changes, right? So the first question was, you know, if we're using theta burst, are we using the right pulse number and the right intensity? And, and how do you measure that? You measure that by changes in cortical excitability as I described earlier, right? And, and we have data on that. So if you give 90% resting motor threshold, this way of kind of measuring intensity of the stimulation and you give 1800 pulses per session, that produces the highest amount of cortical excitability change. If you give 1800 pulses per session in a depression trial, you compare it to sham, oops, sorry, compare it to sham, you get a, you get a pretty good, sep this was published in Brain a number of years ago, pretty good separation from, from sham with, with um, 1800 pulses of intermittent theta burst over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The, the second you know, kind of item that you want to think about if you're think, after you've thought through pulse number, you've thought through intensity is this idea of how frequently do you want to stimulate? And you have to remember that all these stimulation parameters were derived from hippocampal physiology, right? And so if our goal with, uh, with stimulating with kind of a memory signal, if you will, is to, to do something quite simple, to tell a given brain region, in this case, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which I'll talk about in a bit, is, is thought to conceptually be down in depression, right? If you if you want to kind of turn that on and uh, turn that up and have it stay on, you want to send a memory signal into the brain so that the brain region, and this is kind of a weird thing to think about, but remembers to stay on, right? And it's not remember in the way that we think about, I remember that I went and drove, you know, to San Francisco yesterday, right? That's one way of memory. But in this case, it's a different kind of memory, if you will. It's this idea of re this brain region remembering to stay on. Well, there's, a, there's actually a body of literature on this from the basic science world, right? And it's called space learning theory. And the idea is an idea that we all know. Uh, you know it, you intuitively know it if you've ever used note cards to study, right? Uh, you know, I'd ask everybody, I usually ask everybody to raise their hand uh, at this point in the talk, how many people have used note cards, but I can only see uh, uh, Dr. Miller here and he has, so that's good. Um, 
And so this idea that, uh, that you know, Dr. Miller, I'm sure that when you, uh, when you use note cards, you didn't write a note card out, look at it 50 times and then set the note card down and then write out a new note card, right? You never did that. Nobody does that. That's actually called, in, in, this, in this way of thinking about things, that's called in-mass stimulation, right? This idea that I'm going to look at this note card um, and then I'm just gonna keep looking at it without spacing in between. Instead, um, what we know from space learning theory is you need to see something or the brain needs to see something in the case of stimulation and it needs a certain amount of time, and, and this is reflected in dendritic spine enlargement and priming, it needs a certain amount of time before it sees that again. But it does need to see it again to reinforce it, right? And so there's this dance in of time, and actually of time in which, you know, um, from the outside, nothing's happening from the inside, there is something happening, where you stimulate and then you, you have this period of time and then you need to stimulate again. In the case of note cards, that's writing out 60 note cards, going through each one of them for a minute each, and then um, seeing the, that same note card again uh, 60 minutes later. In the case of uh, stimulation, and this, is, this, this study here is in, um, in, in you know, mouse um, hippocampal slice, it's this idea that you're gonna stimulate in this case with intermittent theta burst, you're gonna wait a period of time and they waited 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and you get into the sweet spot of about an hour, hour and a half. And all of a sudden you get this dendritic spine enlargement when you stimulate a second time. And it's incremental, you, you can stimulate, you wait again, you stimulate and you can keep kind of doing this over and over again. And they've, you know, they've, they've replicated this sort of work in, in cortical excitability studies. We're really like waiting 15 minutes you don't get much in the way of a cortical excitability change. You get, you know, you wait 30, you start to get some cortical excitability change. So we can see this kind of over and over again, this principle of needing a certain um, reorganization of TMS in time, right? And that's really what we're talking about is reorganizing the pulses in time to match the way that the mammalian brain optimally learns, right? So that's the first principle that we really thought about in re-engineering the TMS approach. The second one, which the, the pharmacologists in the room are gonna kind of, you know, put your <laughs> hand on your head and go, Doe, why did we, why did we not think about this before? But because of our desire to be exceedingly safe at the beginning of this field, we did not adequately do a dose response curve like we now do um, in modern pharmacology. And this gets back to this idea that I was talking about earlier of psychiatry 3.0, right? We, we first discovered, you know, psychiatric drugs. Um, we, did not, uh, we, we did not have the kind of modern pharmacology tools that we have now where it's kind of very straightforward to know in phase one testing, you're gonna dose escalate, you're gonna try to flatten the curve, you're gonna see if you get unacceptable side effects, that whole story. Right now, it's it's quite clear that uh, that's how you kind of probe, you know, all, kind of all the pharmacological approaches that that we use in modern medicine. But our TMS didn't go through that same sort of uh, approach because we were really concerned about cognition and seizures, and we didn't we didn't know how safe this was. Um, and since then, um, there have been strides in doing this, not really controlled trial strides, but but signals that maybe the original dosing that we utilized was underdosed, right? And so this is the, one of the most compelling examples of this. If you look at, um, at the, the Brainsway um, data after um, they finished the, the RCT, they took folks who were non-responders, right? They were folks who just didn't respond to the original pivotal trial, um, you know, five, six weeks of stimulation. And then they, they took those folks and they said, okay, we'll just keep treating you out to 16 more weeks. So you can think about this, this is almost, you know, this is almost six months worth of stimulation um, laid out, right? And, and what do you observe? You observe the same sort of this, you could overlay this over a pharmacology dose experiment, right? Where, where you start escalating the dose and all of a sudden you get this plateau, 
right? And this is a dose response curve, right? It's, it's an imperfect one because it's not, not controlled, but it is a dose response curve. So this idea that, that all of a sudden you start plateauing the curve after you get a, a, a the, kind of a um, threshold number of pulses per course in, you know? Um, you know, but but doing this sort of dose experiment over, you know, talking to a patient saying, okay, we're going to do this for six months. You have to go, you know, leave work early every day to come out here and do this study. It's really not feasible. And that's why the original approaches didn't really get into six month uh, courses for, for treatment. It's not really a reasonable thing to ask a patient to do either. So I'll kind of get back to this in a bit. And then the third principle that we've been really focused on is this idea of reorganize, reorganization of the stimulation in space. And what I mean is in brain, right? And so I talked about this you know, pretty early on when I said, remember some of these parameters I'm talking about, and I'll, I'll bring them up later, but this idea that you know, we're using uh, the same skull positions in everybody, but we're not using the same brain circuit target in everybody. So really all the original RT and, and this, this, this comment, you know, is, is some, some RTMS researchers don't love this, but I think it's true. If you look at the data, it really is they're kind of in of one studies in many ways, because it's a different brain target for every patient in the sense of at the network level, right? Uh, you know, op TMS there, you were, you were generally in the left or lateral prefrontal cortex, but that that's two Broadman areas that that does a lot of things that does that, you know, left or lateral prefrontal cortex is involved in all sorts of cognitive functions. So, you know, you're not in the same brain network for everybody. Um, you know, there's been a lot of theoretical work, a lot of early work on a lot of different brain targets. Um, for depression and I'm not going to get into the merits of those and the data that we have, but really the, the target that we know the most about is the left or lateral prefrontal cortex. And, um, and if you think about it, if you're going to do a methods um, kind of engineering experiment uh, to develop new stimulation parameters, ones that I'll talk about in a second are quite aggressive, can't do it in normal healthy controls, not ethical the risk benefit isn't there, right? So you have to do it in a clinical population. Um, and you have to do it, in my view, if you want to control for things, you have to do it in the target that we know the most about, right? We know the most about the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And you may ask, well, is this, is this the right target, right? Is this the right target for folks um, with depression? And there, there's converging evidence that this is the case, right? Converging evidence that this is a hub, you know, uh, Mike Fox, who's who's at the Brigham now, um, who's a neurologist who's worked on depression for a long time, um, has done a series of experiments, including lesion studies, uh, where he asks the question, um, and he's done this in kind of hard neurological conditions first, like chemi, uh, post post stroke hemibolismus. Um, what stroke, le what uh, functional connection do all these stroke lesions have in common? Um, you know, that, that, that have the same, same behavioral output. So 50 strokes that cause post-stroke hemibolismus, what are they all functionally connected to on the human connectome project map? And what he's found, um, you know, for depression, uh, post-stroke depression is they're all functionally connected to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, right? So this idea that the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex appears to be a hub. And if you kind of juxtapose that with, gosh, well, when we do RTMS with the first kind of iteration of RTMS, you don't get that great of data. Um, it's not, a, you know, it's not super high remission rates like what, what you would think if that were the hub. Maybe you have to start thinking about your hammer. Maybe you have to start thinking about the tool that you're using. Is the tool complete? Because we know in, in, um, in Parkinson's that if you do deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, you get about 90% of people better, right? And that, that, that is the right target for that problem, right? So, so one, of the, one of the issues, right, is that um, what we're really trying to do here is we're really trying to correct, and this is, for the imagers in the room, this is oversimplified, I know that, um, 
but it's just uh, it's, it's illustrative, uh, so everybody kind of gets on the same page of this. Um, is this idea that the left dorsal lateral re, uh, prefrontal cortex is really regulating the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex in depression in this oversimplified model, but model nonetheless? Um, there's a disruption in the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex inhibition of the subgenual cingulate, and, and TMS is really re regulating that. But the problem has been that if you go to the same skull spot every time, you have these N of one experiments and you're not getting into the same spot in the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, then, then you could get a variability in the data, right? But if you, if you take that same variable data and then you say, and you have, say you have imaging before you stimulate in that data, and then you, you ask the question of what's the linear distance to this ideal spot and, um, and how do people do when they're superimposed over that spot versus they're further away from it, you get this linear relationship. And this finding has been replicated I think six or seven times now, right? That if you're right over this left dorsal lateral subgenual circuit, you get pretty robust antidepressant effect with conventional RTMS um, to, um, to that circuit. If you're pretty far away, you get very little clinical effect. Um, Sean Siddiqui and Mike Fox published more recent version of this and, and the, the line is even more steep and the data is even tighter. I mean, just really, really compelling. Um, we took uh, approach at doing this by using hierarchical clustering. So this idea that um, you can use this mid-level machine learning approach to cluster similarly behaving voxels within regions of interest that you're interested in, in this case, a target pair, and it's always a target pair. Um, so left or lateral prefrontal cortex, you get a certain amount of clustering, you get a certain amount of clustering in the subgenual anterior cingulate. And then we apply this uh, decision algorithm to pick the spot within the left or lateral prefrontal cortex that's most anti-correlated with the subgenual anterior cingulate. And we do that not just by looking at the amount of anti-correlation, but also the parameters that seem to be relevant as it relates to the physiology, the physics of, of TMS stimulation, right? And so it's a great primate study that out, came out a couple of years ago in Nature Communications demonstrating it's very focal RTMS effect um, on, on, on EFIS that's, you know, about a couple of millimeters. And you want to get your TMS uh, coil in the center of the cluster it's big enough to fit it in there and it's anti-correlated enough um, to, to do what we wanted to do, which is to be antidepressant. And this is all automated, right? We, we, we have this kind of automated approach to doing this. It outputs a target that can be overlaid over the structural brain. And then that is what this Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy is, right? It's this engineering that I described earlier where we reorganized this RTMS in space. We or reorganized it in time. And we are doing this dose escalation study. And so when I first started doing this, people thought this was crazy, right? This idea that you're going to give, we're giving 18,000 pulses of intermittent theta bursts a day. This is the equivalent of the FDA approved six week course. Um, but I knew from a lot of a lot of different experiences and planted devices and, and, and DLPFC and other um, experiences that nobody sees this with that. Nobody has cognitive side effects. I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is really the way that the brain learns, right? And so we're able to give, you know, that that six months, you know, open label study I was describing earlier, we're able to give seven and a half months worth of conventional RTMS in five days. And we're able to do this dose response curve experiment that you pragmatically can't do if you're just giving the once a day stimulation. You know, this is the, again, reorganization in space, dose, I'm sorry, reorganization of time, dose, and then reorganization in space. We published down three, three publications, two in the American Journal, one in, in, this, um, in this brain letter. The brain letter is, um, is the first publication. Um, this didn't get as much press as the subsequent two, but uh, you know, really important first study because 
we, we were able to stimulate folks who um, met Helen Mayberg's uh, DBS criteria, right? So they'd fail DCT. Um, she didn't require failure of RTMS. I required it because everybody was gonna, just gonna say it, maybe it was a non-specific RTMS effect. They failed a number of medications. Uh, many of them, um, all of them met criteria to get a DBS consultation. Many of them had had one. Um, some had DNS implants, ketamine. I mean, these are, if, if you're the treatment resistant depression, you know, researchers uh, in the audience, these are the patients you're, you're talking to saying, I don't have anything for you anymore, right? Or, you know, you can try these, these new studies. That I'm not sure if it's going to work for you because you failed everything. They're actually kind of hard to find. Uh, I, I, I went into this thinking I could find these people, you know, pretty quickly. And I, I had to really call around uh, to find uh, folks that failed all of this stuff. And, you know, we, we, we stimulated these folks and after the week was over, they, they on average went, you know, below a modulus of 10. This was, um, you know, the, the only time many of these folks had been well in decades, right? And they were ecstatic. Um, they were ecstatic and it was like flowers for Algernon, right? You, um, you saw these folks get well and they looked like a million bucks and then they lost it relatively quickly. And everybody um, was quick to tell me that, hey, this is so clear what this is. This is placebo effect. You are seeing placebo effect from folks being there for a week. And I said, you know, I, I just don't think so. These people are folks who frankly failed ECT, you know, 20 sessions of ECT, nothing, you know. And I, I had seen something like this before because I'd worked with Mark George and Ziad Nahas on implanted cortical stimulators. Um, for the same sort of treatment resistance level. Now, not so efficient. It took forever for them to get to this point. Um, you know, and I could talk about why I think that is. I think, I think these principles that we learned help us to get there, but they, you know, they, got, they got to a similar point nonetheless in a similar sort of treatment resistance level. And what we observed with a lot of these folks, and these were in the early, this was in the early days of implanted devices for psychiatry was that if they had gone on some sort of vacation and they went through the metal detector in there, stimulator got shut off on accident and they didn't know about a week later they did the same sort of thing right they relapsed back really quickly and so you need probably an implanted device doing the same sort of thing that we're doing um, uh, with rtms but with an electrical stimulation kind of ongoing and, and we've got some money to do that uh, now and we have an interest in doing that so that we can treat these most severe folks that seem to need a whole lot of stimulation um, and I can get into the, the benefits of why this is gr a great philosophically and scientifically a great way of thinking about this, because I think you can, if you've got an implanted device and a non, and a non-invasive device that are effectively doing a similar thing, you really start to understand, um, you know, these approaches and you can get into that, uh, at another time. Um, the second paper is this, uh, American journal paper that came out in 2020, um, you know, and so we, we said, okay, we've we ethically justified this. We treated the sickest of the sick that needed brain surgery. You know, we thought this was less risky than brain surgery. It clearly was. We had no seizures. We had no, no problems. You know, DBS surgery, there's a bleed risk. And so then we said, okay, we can treat folks who are a little less treatment resistant than that, right? They, they weren't folks who were, were ECT failures, but some of it failed RTMS you know, nearly half of them had failed seven or more med failures, you know, so these were not trivially depressed folks either. Their, their moderate score at entry was kind of mid thirties. Um, and, and what we observed is, um, is this dose response curve, right? This dose response curve that I was talking about earlier. So this is the ham six, you know, day zero to day one is the conventional RTMS dose, right? It's this idea that um, you know, if you, if you just look at the day, day zero to day one, say, say we just stopped there, then you'd say, huh, well, this is okay. You know, it's not that great, but it's okay. It seems to help some of these people on average, just kind of the way that people talk about conventional RTMS. But if you keep going, give more dose, all of a sudden you start to see something that looks quite miraculous actually, right? Which is that we're getting the vast majority of people below that remission line. In the case of the HAM6, it's five, the score of five. You know, so by day three, which is what we call Magic Wednesday, my 
my CRCs and RAs call Magic Wednesday because they, they, this is the day that people on average come in remitted. Um, you start to see the, the, the majority of folks starting to go below that remission line. And, and you know, by day five, everybody does. What's interesting, and I didn't say this earlier, is that if you take those ECT failing folks in that first small study and you, and you look at their, their kind of time course, it takes them until day five, right? If you take the folks that are EC, I'm sorry, RTMS failing versus RTMS naive, you get a different curve. So the folks that are RTMS failing, it takes Thursday. If they failed ECT, it takes Friday. If they're RTMS naive, all of a sudden they're crossing the line on Tuesday, right? And the relapse time frame is matched up with the treatment resistance level, right? Where you see, if I superimpose that curve from the first trial, you'd see a pretty quick relapse in the ECT failing folks, RTMS failing folks, they, they relapse faster. The, the TMS naive folks, they relapse um, uh, slower than the, the RTMS folks, right? And so, then the question is, is this repeatable, right? right? Can you treat and retreat? You get the same thing when you when you repeat this, and you do, right? You get you get to the same place uh, over and over again. It's it's we've treated some folks five six times now since 2014, 2015 with this, and we've we've gotten the same effect over and over again. It's really reproducible. We've had zero patients tachyphylax out of this. Just to say. And then you ask the question of, well, all this fancy imaging that you're talking about, does it really matter? And so we, we you know, put the targets relative to F3, which is an EEG uh, electrode position that people use for, for our TMS targeting. And ask the question of where, where the targets cluster. I was actually pretty surprised by this. I thought some of them would be closer to F3, but as you can see, they're very far away. You know, some of them are five centimeters away, which is the same distance roughly is where you are from from the standard spot to the motor cortex, you know. So these are these are very uh, distant. So we you know this is um, we we conducted a randomized control trial recently uh, in moderate to severe MDD only. Some of these these folks I talked about earlier had bipolar two, kind of a minority, but these were all MDD folks. Moderate severe depression, moderate to severe treatment resistance. We excluded history of RTMS because of the blind. History of ECT non-response, not because we can't treat those folks, but because they relapse pretty quickly. And what we found is that, that the SANE approach is, is reproducibly efficacious. Um, and here's our consort diagram. So 32 folks, two were excluded uh, prior, to, prior to starting. We enrolled them, and then that weekend, one of them we had a history of cancer, didn't tell us she had whole brain radiation. We looked at her scan and it looked bad, so we had to exclude her. And then one person didn't want to be on a blinded trial. One of the patients in the active group didn't um, wasn't transparent with us about their diagnosis. So uh, 29 out of 29 patients um, analyzed. You know, these were these were sick folks. So um, you know, these were nine years in the current episode, mid-20s, duration of illness, about half of them were unemployed. Uh, I had one patient who told me that she flipped a coin. This was kind of scary, and she was halfway into her week and was feeling better, thank God, when she told me this. Uh, she flipped a coin. She's either going to kill herself with a helium tank or do our study. She flipped the coin to the helium tank. She went to Party City. They didn't have it. She wasn't transparent with us about the, her level of suicidality, obviously, uh, so she decided to enroll in our studies. These were sick people. These were kind of ECT-level individuals. Uh, Mid-30s, Madra score at entry. And this is, these are our, our outcomes as a response um, numbers in the bottom. Uh, effect sizes between 1.4 and 1.9, very large effects. Our sham um, group had very little um, uh, response. Our blind guess was totally intact. Nobody knew what they were getting. I, I can't even understand how that really happened. And, and not many people, <laughs> everybody asks me why I don't, I don't really understand how the blind guess uh, and in such an effective treatment was as it was, but nonetheless, it, it was totally blind. The p-value is 0.8 on the guess. Um, if you look at the single subject data, 78.5% uh, of people crossed the remission line at some point in that four-week follow-up. Now, they crossed at various times, you know, like this guy with the orange, um, orange circles crossed really late. Um, you know, some people relapsed really quickly. 
we've got to figure that out. But nonetheless, um, you know, quite a few people crossed that line versus sham where you didn't see much of that at all and the same sort of target distribution. And so getting back to this kind of intended use, we piloted, oh, and uh, I'll mention now NIH is funding us for a larger 100 patient trial for this. Um, now, you know, for the intended use, this idea that we can treat suicidal inpatients in this emergency, this idea that I introduced at the beginning of the talk that we don't have a good treatment for that problem. I hope I've convinced you that we have engineered something that can do the job in five days, which is a standard inpatient mission. But can we do it in, you know, suicidal inpatients? Can we actually do this in people that are admitted to the psychiatric hospital for suicidal ideation. Um, so we took folks who are you know, quite severe, um, 1.5 suicide attempts on average for this group. Now this is open label data, it's feasibility, but you know, we're gonna show it's, a little, it's feasible. You know, two hospitalizations on average. You know, so these were, some of them had, had ECT and were intolerant or, or whatnot. So this, this are our, our pilot data, um, you know, moderates in the mid to, to high 30s. Um, this is not a non-inferiority study. It's a small n. It's, it's a retrospective matching. But just to give folks a sense of things, you know, um, quite quick, much quicker than ECT. That's pretty clear. Um, and uh, it doesn't look inferior in its efficacy on this look. You know, well, obviously there's a lot of science needs to happen to really figure that out, but compelling nonetheless. If you look at the SSI scores, you see a pretty significant SSI drop on day one. I love to ask patients, you know, when we were doing open label trials, you know, I'd, I'd ask them, when's the last time you thought about suicide and people that are chronic ideators? And they'd look at you and then they'd have this confused look because they just, they'd forgotten that they hadn't had suicidal ideation in the last two days. And that's what you see. The first thing that goes is the ideation. And for people that have an effect, that ideation loss sticks around for a long time. Now we followed them out for six months and then we stopped. I wish we'd followed it longer, but um, interesting nonetheless. This is a, my group, it's larger now and different people. This is pre-COVID. So I'm really hoping to have a great picture post uh, all of this kind of wrapping up in five years or whatever it's gonna be. Maybe we have to break down and, and take a picture with masks. Um, and this is our funding. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be funded by uh, a number of individuals. And I, and I didn't, I need to put this up here, but we're actually also funded by Welcome Leap. We have that, some of that Welcome Leap funding for anhedonic depression. Um, we're about to start that trial. So uh, I'll need to add that um, logo, but uh, really appreciate particularly NARSAD, uh, you know, NIH who fund, funded us and supported us along the way, as well as uh, more, more recently Pritzker. Um, great, I guess I'm right on time and uh, happy to answer questions. Fantastic, thank you, Nolan. That was really a tour de force, a fantastic talk. Uh, Dr. Lieberman, I don't know if you would like to lead us off with the, any questions. Um, yeah, uh, Nolan, uh, excellent talk and a really good um, overview of the history and the current state of the art. Um, I, I um, wanted to ask a couple of questions that may sound critical or probative, but you know, it's not to diminish the, the uh, rigor of the science that's involved in, in what you've been doing. But um, on one hand, I completely agree and like your characterization of like the third modality of treatment being your know, brain stimulation, neuromodulation. And up until recently, we only had you know, ECT, which was encumbered by you know, its notorious reputation. Um, but with the emergence of things like RTMS with theta burst or not, with direct current uh, transcranial stimulation, uh, with the prospect of um, focused ultrasound, um, you know, there's hope that we can do things more invasive than ECT or, or DBS. Um, the problem, of course, is the skull and the smearing. So you have two methodologic issues. You know, one is how do you do it non-invasively? Uh, uh, and the second is, since we don't have lesion diseases, or at least insofar as we know, 
um, what's a, a reliable and efficient way of identifying the, the target for the stimulation. And um, so that's, that's, that's a question. And then, you know, hearing how you've uh, uh, very um, systematically and, and, and plausibly described the uh, evolution of the research, which is you know, identified problems and sought to try and overcome them by doing better sort of mapping of the um, uh, neural circuitry activity, and then using that as a basis for determining target. Um, and this may sound like an unfair character. It's a little like the, and, and my age allows me to make this comparison. It's a little like the old psychotherapy literature, which is it, the, it's the way the individual psychotherapist implements a mode of psychotherapy that seems to be a critical factor. And on one hand, uh, it may be a skill function. On the other hand, it may be kind of a cop-out or a way of, um, of explaining away the lack of consistent efficacy. So, um, you know, in your sense, you, you have refined it in a way that you think you can get a certain kind of success rate on a specific uh, enriched sample of patients within a certain period of time. How, how, how generalizable or disseminable do you think is that? Yes. Uh, so just to, I'll, I'll repeat your questions as you, as I understood them. So the first question is, how do we translate some of what we found non-invasively to more invasive approaches? Is that right? And then the second one? Well, no, do you think the non-invasive approaches will work? Um, you know, despite the fact that you're dealing with um, uh, the issue of uh, smearing from the skull yeah. and the okay. lack right, of specificity of, of the, of the, the target, um, uh, the target yeah. lesion or circuit. Yeah, so I mean, just the, I guess your question one and three are similar in that way. So just to be um, clear, so, so there are multiple levels of evidence that kind of converge on this DLPFC subgenual circuit. So one way of doing it, I highlighted this earlier, is if you, if you, know, if you, you know that, and we do know this, that the left DLPFC works uh, for depression and how well it works, you can argue that, but it works, right? Multiple meta-analyses that RTMS and depression works, it separates from sham, that's kind of scientifically known, right? And so then there's this issue, you're in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, where should you be? And so in retrospective studies across seven, eight labs, they've asked the same question of, if you look at linear distance to this ideal left or lateral subgenual target, irrespective of the particulars of the therapist, if you will, and that analogy that you used, just our modern methods of looking at the resting state connectivity between these two regions, it's irrespective of therapist, right? Eight therapists did this, they all found the same thing, right? And, and, and that's one way of looking at it, right? That, converging evidence, if you place the coil in the standard spot and look at distant, linear distance to the ideal target, you're gonna get the same relationship of the closer you are to that ideal target, the more antidepressant effect, right? And that's without a lesion, that's, there's no lesion there. That's perturbation mapping of a, a, of a named brain region and then asking its functional relationships. Now, Mike Fox did this work with brain lesions causing depression. Now, you can argue that a stroke causing MD, you know, an MDD-like syndrome is not truly MDD, but you know, these folks quack like a duck, right? They meet an MDD diagnosis, you know? And if you ask the question of every single, you put every single patient, and he did this with like hundreds of patients, every single patient that had a stroke that, that caused a DSM diagnosable MDD onto the human connectome map. And you ask, what are those all functionally connected to? They're all functionally connected to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So you've got this convergence of evidence across these, um, these studies of looking at perturbation essentially of a region in idiopathic MDD patients and the distance to that spot and stroke lesions and they're all converging on that same position. And so that gets to your second question, which is 
can we scale this, right? Can we scale this? And so, you know, we have patents on this stuff. Um, we have a company who spun out of Stanford. Some of my students are in that company, $25 million in venture funding to do just that, right? To scale uh, this approach out to the, to the masses and be able to do this in a big way. And they've convinced highly <laughs> questioning venture capitalists that they, you know, that they can do that. Um, and they can do that because you can put this in a cloud and you can, with advanced computing, generate targets in minutes from anywhere in the world, right? And that's, um, you know, I, I think that that's the way you have to do it if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do something like this. The beauty of that is that now all of a sudden, if you could do it and you can do it clinically, all of a sudden you've got millions of brain scans of depressed patients and you've got millions of target positions. And now you're not talking about 30 or 50 or 100 subjects, you're talking about a lot of subjects that are being treated clinically with all of this dense information. And then you can, and then that's every therapist involved or whatever in your analogy, right? And I think, I think that, that um, that'll really get us to the next level, right? And get us past, is this a given lab's particular way of pre-processing the resting state data or, whatever it is, right? We can get to some consensus conclusion on this. And, and it's hard for the reasons that you're describing. We don't have a lesion, you know, um, in, in, in my view, you know, one, one way of, the, of thinking about this, and this is the kind of Catherine Scangos UCSF way of thinking about it that was described last week for you guys, Grand Rounds, is you stick 18 wires in the brain and you, and you ask in every mood regulatory region in the brain, you know, what's moving when the mood moves, right? Uh, it's a highly aggressive way of doing it. Another way of, of thinking about it is using perturbation uh, mapping, essentially. Can you per perturb in a non-invasive way with some, you know, very aggressive tools stimulation-wise and try to sort this out? I, I think that the field will learn from both of those, you know, philosophical kind of viewpoints. Um, I don't think that one of them is right and one of them is wrong. I think that scaling wise, RTMS uh, is much more scalable uh, than the neurosurgery uh, is, is, is obvious. Um, but, um, you know, I don't totally know what the future holds in that way. So very encouraging. Well, thanks. Thanks, Nolan. Yeah. Great. I'm going to get to a trainee question that I'll pair with another attendee question from Jared Airy and John Kelp. A converging question is about what the course of treatment might look like over time. And if you see this as a treatment that would need to be a maintenance treatment, like a medication might be. Yeah, so the way that, that we're conceptualizing this now is kind of three different types of patients. The first type of patient, we've seen some of this. Um, my, my first RCT subject I called recently, we had some of this media stuff, trying to find folks that would be interested in you know, being on TV. <laughs> not, I learned not too many people are interested in being on TV. So I called, called this individual and asked, um, you know, how he was doing, he was still well at four years, right? So he had five days, still totally remitted at four years. We had some college students who we have treated every spring break all through college, got them through college. Their freshman year, they had a huge mood episode. We treated them, you know, and treated them every spring break after that. And we were able to keep them well. And they kind of got worse right before spring break. So a cute course for a subpopulation you know, there's some people, and you saw that in our individual plots, where some people, you know, relapsed relatively quickly. There's going to be a maintenance form, just like with ECT, you know, 25% uh, of people after an acute ECT course relapse within the first week. Uh, Joan Prudick uh, published that in 93 uh, from Columbia, right? Um, you know, so, so you, you, you need maintenance for that reason. You need, you need to have uh, maintenance for a subpopulation of these folks. And then, and then the third bit, and that's the, this group that I showed that was the first small study, this implanted study, or the, this uh, implant level study, are folks who, who relapse really quickly. And, and, you know, doing probably a very dense maintenance schedule is not going to work out, you know, to get them back to work or whatever. Um, you know, and, it, and that gets into this idea of being able to emulate this with an implanted device. And to Dr. Lieberman's point, right? How do we think about, you know, how do we think about TMS and focality and, and all of that? There's that primate study I mentioned earlier where, you know, they, they 
they did this physiology experiment and they were able to show that it's actually quite a small uh, activation of, of neurons, two millimeters in that case. Um, so how do you how do you emulate that with an implanted device and maintain people forever, right? And so you could do that um, you could do that through an epidural implant like we've done before, through an intracalvarial implant where you actually drill down into to get a part of the bone uh, quite thin and then overlay a stimulator. You know, it's essentially a millimeter above the epidural space. There there are a lot of ways to kind of deal with that, but you could you could in theory electrically emulate that and maintain folks um, in that case, as long as the battery is on. Um, and, and that's how we're, we're thinking about it. And what's cool about that is from my perspective, you can treat anybody and there's not really been a treatment that could do this treatment kind of platform that could do this. You could treat anybody from one, one med failure all the way to, to the sickest of the sick uh, and, and hopefully keep them well chronically, so. Great, okay. This is a mechanistic question from Tanisha Kearney Ramos. Uh, it's a long yeah. question. It's also in the Q and A, uh, Nolan, that you'll be able to see. Does the concept of homeostatic metaplasticity play a role in the spaced learning effects of certain RTMS parameters on brain changes? I.e., does optimizing ITBS parameters around these spacing effects work by enabling us to supersede biological mechanisms? which are aimed at keeping functions within homeostatic ranges, which might otherwise inhibit large perturbations changes needed for clinically meaningful response? Or is it simply a function permitting cumulative processes relevant to neuroplasticity, e.g. receptor and neurotransmitter expression, localization, et cetera, where LTP takes time? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's um, a series of spaced CTBS papers that are like, homeostatic metaplasticity colon, you know, spaced CTBS. <laughs> so, and, I, and I'm happy, and, and hi, by the way, kind of, uh, I know you were, you were um, with, at MUSC with uh, Colleen uh, and Mark for a while. So great to, great, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think that, uh, you know, TRD is essentially a new, new homeostatic set point, right? That in, in, in the really treatment resistant folks, they just seem to want to, Kind of drift back into that set point, right? And I think that we have to overcome that through these mechanisms that you've eloquently laid out um, in, in your question, right? And so this idea of really pushing um, pushing a learning approach that that tries to push that system into kind of relearning. And I think if I think there's probably a, a point, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, I guess fortunately from the biology to understand it, unfortunately, from, for the, from the patient's perspective, but it's probably a set point where people transition to where all of a sudden they're in that new, that new place. And it's probably going to be hard to think of them ever not drifting back to that place. Um, you know, we've had a couple of people, like I said earlier, who've just gone on and on and they haven't needed retreatment. So maybe they weren't so treatment resistant that they were, they were past that point. But I think that you're absolutely right. That we're fighting against that point. And, and it's really the way I see it is a drift back. It's a drift back to that, um, to that point um, that, that they came in that new kind of homeostatic set point. So great. Another question, uh, would genetics or past family history of depression play a role in the treatment of the Saint protocol? We, we have not had that as any sort of inclusion exclusion. We haven't, you know, we, we have, um, you know, we have noticed that folks, for some reason, we had this kind of <laughs> large sample of people going through a divorce in our RCT for whatever reason, like four or something patients, they were kind of, you know, going through a divorce. So, so for whatever reason, this was an attractive study to those, to those folks. Um, so we saw so that sort of, of thing, as far as, of, as far as family history, we, we, we really didn't see that have any role in say durability or anything like that. We looked at all of that. Um, now that we have funding for kind of hundreds of um, patients across trials, we'll really start to look at that. We've got collaborations with, with folks at NYU around, around, you know, various, um, you know, blood-based measures that we're looking at. So we're really gonna, we're gonna try to kind of dive deeper into that question over uh -huh. the next five years, so. 
Great. And then a question from Michael Avisar. Could there be any advantages to real-time targeting approaches, like using simultaneous TMS fMRI or TMS EEG to time the pulses? It's a great question. So um, TMS fMRI, uh, I, I hired a postdoc specifically working on some of that from a mechanistic standpoint. As, as you know, and I think uh, a lot of people that have tried to do this interleave TMS fMRI work, it's um, it's tricky. Um, it's tricky because it's a magnet and a magnet, right? Um, and so, you know, trying to get an entire right now, the kind of the the equipment isn't there to try to kind of time all of all of this whole say Saint course with interleaving a, an fMRI acquisition in those inner train intervals. Essentially, is what you'd have to do. Um, you know, people have done short bursts of theta burst in between fMRI acquisitions to try to, to try to get some sense of the mechanism. And I have um, the, the postdoc that worked on that in Vienna now working on that, but it's, it's tough. It's not there yet. For EEG, a lot of people have thought about, about that. Um, there, there are a couple of papers out which are very promising where if you get just the native um, EEG frequencies of folks and you utilize those to to somewhat change the ITBS parameter set. So the theta is really that person, native theta, the, you know, and, and the, the bursts are really their gamma, whatever, then you can, you can use that to, to stimulate versus, you know, five Hertz and 50, which is what we use for, for, for Saint right now. Um, in the welcome leap money that we have, it's a to, without getting too, too in the weeds about what it is, Jeff Daskalas, is the chair of psychiatry at UCSD, is doing just that. He's taking Saint, he's doing kind of standard Saint, and then he's doing EEG personalized Saint and then sham and, and asking that question, right? Um, so. Great. Nolan, I wanted to ask you a, a slightly different question, which is about, you know, there are a lot of trainees at Grand Rams, about how you see training in psychiatry to kind of prepare the next generations of clinicians for the you know circuit-based neuromodulatory approaches, I you know I noted in the introduction that you did um, training in both psychiatry and neurology. I'm curious your thoughts about like what should someone graduating from a psychiatry residency in the 2020s know? Like what should they know about? circuit-based approaches, neurostimulation, and what should they be able to do? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and thanks for that. I, I um, so Mark George and I wrote a couple of papers in 2014 and then uh, we published a recent one around this idea of interventional psychiatry as a subspecialty of psychiatry. And, as, and, and in those 2014 papers, one of them was an educational paper in academic psychiatry kind of outlining the, um, the current ACM, ACGME, ABPN sort of requirements for training in, in psychiatry and those milestones and how, how to think about neuromodulation related to those. And so, you know, I, I am of the bias that, you know, we, we could implement this within, you know, psychi psychiatric education broadly and uh, have, have this be something that every psychiatric resident learns. I think we're in that in that kind of historical period, similar to, you know, uh, between psychiatry 1.0 and psychiatry 2.0, you know, the analysts and psychopharmacologists where, you know, there, there's a, there is a varying, there's varying degrees of, of your kind of a range of opinions on how important that is and how, how embedded that is from not at all. And it shouldn't be, and it's still very fringe to this is, you know, you know, Kind of part of our curriculum, right? Um, I, I'm biased to think that it it should be because I see I see this is where things are going, and I, and I don't think that you know my kind of introduction of this concept of psychiatry 3.0. I don't think that it's it's necessarily just neurostimulation. I think it's rethinking therapy, rethinking meds from this circuit vantage point. And I think there's you know when you when you look at it like that, I think there's a broader um, educational mission there of really thinking in those terms. And I can tell you that the drug companies are thinking in that way. They're thinking, how do we, how do we, you know, implement these circuit measures for our drugs? I mean, it's not just 
neurostimulation. And so in that way, I think that it's going to be, it's going to be critically important. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if that ends up happening. I don't know if this just ends up being subspecialty training after, you know, it's, it's an open question. And I think it'll probably play out in the next decade. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, one other, you know, you spoke about dose response curves and um, the, the dose in your case was the number of administrations, right? The number of days or weeks, et cetera, how long, how long a TMS um, course was administered for. And it just made me think about antidepressant clinical trials where we see late responses, like in, you, you alluded to STAR-D earlier, right? There were people who initially achieved response and remission eight weeks after starting an SSRI, 10, 12 weeks after. And I, you know, it's not clear to me in those cases whether that's a dose effect or a duration effect, you know, like those dose and duration can kind of get a little conflated there. And I'm wondering yeah. sort of how you think about that. Like, is there late on late late onset of a response if you had given the first three days and not the, the fourth and the fifth, might some people respond late to the earlier stimulation? It's a great question. And we, um, you know, we actually, you know, we actually observed some people had even with the five days had a later response in that in that single subject data that I described earlier. When I was thinking about dose in the pharmacological sense, I was thinking about dose as it relates to milligrams per day, but, but you're absolutely right. It's also accumulation of that dose over time, right? Um, and, you know, it, I think it's an open, it's an open question and it, and it, it may be individual specific. Those late responders are all interestingly uh, over the age of 50, right? We've never seen a young, younger person have these delayed responses. And from a neuroscience standpoint, I have no idea why that is. You know, there's ideas that there are differences in brain plasticity as you age. We've seen that with our TMS studies and cortical excitability, but we don't have direct measures of that. I can only hypothesize about that. Dr. Lieberman? Uh, yeah. Um, so, Nolan, depression in the way MDD diagnosis, it is really a, a very broad uh, rubric. And, um, you know, you've selected as, you know, the population to initiate some of your studies is the TRD group, um, which, you know, I think is good in terms of identifying a specific, more homogeneous subtype. Um, given the level of non-invasiveness, it is certainly doesn't need to be limited to it like DBS would. Um, but I, I was trying to think, um, do we have reasonable population estimates? If, you know, you, you, you had de described um, criteria for defining moderate depression as being as disabling as a heart attack and uh, severe depression as being you know, more disabling, et cetera. Do we have um, good estimates on what the proportion of people who meet criteria for MDD are in these different categories and, and how valid do you think they are other than just arbitrary de definitions based on, on the severity of symptoms? So you're asking what percentage of TRD, what percentage of MDD patients are TRD or what percentage? You have, you have MDD as a broad diagnosis, yeah. and then within it, you have subtypes that are defined either by symptomatology, like psychotic depression, yeah. or you have um, definitions based on severity. Um, yeah. Do we have um, you know, reliable estimates of the proportions of MDD in the different subtype categories? Yeah, I mean, I think so, you know, about a third of people are TRD. If you're talking about, you know, if, if you're thinking in terms of we're subtyping this, that third into an even smaller number, um, you know, I, I think that it's probably half of that is what we're, we're, if we took everybody that met criteria other than their treatment resistance level being too low or their current severity too low, probably half of that. It's about, I'd say 15% of the total. The, re the reasoning for doing that, I didn't have a slide for this, but the reasoning for, for taking only moderate and severe levels of treatment resistance is if you look at, um, if you take the data for, for particularly one RTMS trial that I was looking at in particular, and you, and you look at that um, number of med failures, and that level of treatment resistance versus sham, the folks in that mild treatment resistance group do um, just as well with sham as they do with active. As you get into the higher levels of treatment resistance, 
you start to lose the sham effect. And in high, in the Maudsley definition of treatment resistance, in that high Maudsley category, you get no sham effect. And so, you know, from a, it's a great question. And from a trial design point, we're looking for, you know, folks who are not going to be particularly placebo responsive, and they're going to be quite, hopefully quite active responsive. And so that's the, that's kind of the clinical trial design game that I think you're alluding to. Um, as far as kind of, you know, a broader population, I think you can do it with, you know, you can study those folks, but then the numbers, as you know, the numbers end up being larger, right? Because all of a sudden you're getting all this watering down of your effect because you're getting all the sham response in people who've failed one med and have been depressed for two months or something like that. You're going to, that, that type of person's going to have, you know, we, you know, on, on average going to have a, a much higher chance of having a placebo response. And so then you need pharmacology level numbers, you know, and, and that gets to be a very expensive trial. And, and so I, is that, is that kind of cover what, how you're thinking about it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the late Fred Quitkin found a similar pattern when he was looking at the effects of placebo by stratified by illness severity compared to antidepressant medication. But one of the other reasons why it's important to understand this is uh, to get insurance to pay for this on a regular basis, uh, they would probably want to have more specificity as to um, you know, for what portion of the depressed population it's uh, uh, justifiably indicated for. Absolutely. So as it stands, as, as, as you know, is the conventional RTMS insurance would pay at the fourth med failure. Um, so we saw that with Medicare, we saw that with the private pay folks. And, and there have been a number of studies that have been quite compelling about not, not acute costs. TMS is extremely expensive, whether it be what we're doing or conventional RTMS acutely. But if you look at the two-year outcomes and you compare them to say star D, Step four, you know, uh, we start getting into cytomel and lithium and all that stuff. At the two year mark, the costs are the same. And so then insurance looks at that and says, huh, okay, well, then we're going to cover TMS. And they've actually moved now, Medicare, at least in California, is, is paying at the second med failure. Um, we've also, and I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but we also talked, you know, we also have this NIH trial for, for suicidal ideation. Sorry, my daughter's in the next room. Suicidal ideation, and as you know, you know there was a recent lithium, um, you know, trial failure for suicidal ideation. So we don't have very good treatments for that. And so I think that's a place where we could really get into that more treatment naive group, but they're acutely severe, mm -hmm. and try to see if we can kind of go into a, a larger, you know, a larger kind of level of treatment resistance, but really folks who are kind of focused on that high severity. Kind of emergency setting and so i think that's the other area that we'd hope to kind of be able to get some headway in i can't resist that saying that are you referring to the va study right yeah yeah I, i've always found that the va studies find contrary results to expectations and uh, not that i dismiss them but um i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't preclude the uh fact that lithium still is a uh, uh, a superior treatment with respect to the potential to uh, alleviate the suicidal behavior. Yeah, fair. I'm going to see if we can get to two last questions with maybe rapid responses, Nolan. Uh, Jacques Ambrose says, I really appreciated the anti-correlated treatment to SGACC for LD, LPFC. What are your thoughts on combining inhibitory and excitatory protocols? Yeah, a lot of people have asked me about this. Can you can you do excitatory on the left, inhibitory on the right? You know, um, right seems to be better for for anxiety. Um, you know, this is a <clears throat> this is an open question. It is very logistically difficult to do the <laughs> left alone, and so we we've, we've kind of stuck with that. But um, but it's an it's an open question, and we've done um, we've done inhibitory stimulation in in the right frontal pole for OCD, and I didn't present that data just from a time constraint standpoint, looks quite good. We had three out of seven people go below the YBOC 10 line, um, you know, which is good. Um, and that's, that's accelerated inhibition of, of right uh, frontal pole. So early days, you know, lots of things to do. And then our final question, again, from Michael Avisar, has there been any research on pairing TMS with pharmacology or tasks? 
to put the brain in a more plastic or receptive state? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a little bit of data for pharmacology. It's like a wide open, whenever, pharmaco whenever drug companies ask me, come and want my opinion on what they should think about, I always say the same thing. Somebody's got to really explore this pharmacology, neurostimulation interaction space because we have no idea what's going on with that and we really need to know um, because it's a, it's a big deal in the same way that the psychotherapy pharma interaction, you know, was a big deal. And we, we learned a lot from looking at that. Um, and so, you know, I think that's definitely a big question. And then, you know, there's this, there's this whole liter you know, base of literature around what do you do before, during, and after the stimulation. And there are experiments demonstrating effect changes in the effect of stimulation based off of when the stimulation is happening relative to some sort of external um, or internal uh, you know, behavior or, or stimulus, right? So if you have somebody look at their hand versus not look at their hand and then stimulate motor cortex, you can have a, a difference in the cortical excitability effect. You know, there's multiple studies with PTSD and OCD and, and smoking where you need to do a cue during the stimulation to, to pair it with the stimulation to get an actual therapeutic effect. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of open questions there too. And that also is, uh, as Dr. Epistar is pointing out, very, very uh, early days and unexplored. And uh, really we, we, we are only at the tip of the iceberg and knowing what to do uh, behaviorally and what, what kind of what context people should be in. Thanks, Nolan, for a great talk and a great discussion. I mean, your talk generated so much interest and, and questions, so we probably could have spent another hour <laughs> discussing this. But thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.